Did you know that it takes around 5,000 to 20,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of beef? And it, that it takes around 4,000 to 5,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of wheat? Food systems are a complex relation between producers, processors, and consumers, and should take economic, environmental, and social issues into consideration. The current food systems need to be improved to sustainably deliver the quality of the diets needed for men, women, children's health, but at the same time also allowing sustainable economic growth. Poor diets are a major contributing factor to the increasing level of obesity and associated non-communicable diseases in the regions. So these are some of the facts in the region. My name is Raymond Yele. I'm the regional program leader at FAO here in the region, and I will be your moderator today. Let me welcome you all to this webinar on sustainable food systems and healthy diets in Europe and Central Asia by the regional office in preparation of the upcoming regional conference, the main FAO governing body in the region. I hand over for the opening statement to our assistant director general and regional representative for Europe and Central Asia, Vladimir Rachmanin. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, good morning, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to see uh, many familiar faces as well as new faces uh, here. And I very much appreciate your dedication and contribution to the work of FAO. The basic human right for every man, woman, and child is to access a healthy diet. And it still presents challenges in Europe and Central Asia. Undernourishment exists as people cannot access the required quality and range of nutritious foods. And micronutrient deficiency continues to persist in certain countries of our region. Furthermore, overweight and obesity is now a major issue in this region and often way above the world average of 13% of population. This panel today is convened to introduce the item on sustainable food system and healthy diets for the ministerial roundtable discussion, agenda item eight at the upcoming FAO Regional Conference for Europe, which will be held on November two to four. And I'm absolutely sure that we'll all benefit from your discussion. Little did anyone know when the roundtable topic was agreed in mid-2019 that we would be in the midst of a global pandemic and tasks with ensuring that a health crisis does not become a food security crisis with long-term impacts on the economies and social fabric of our countries, our communities. While COVID-19 has exposed fragilities in our food systems, it had only served to reinforce the importance of food systems. Food systems transformation was already highlighted as key to achieving sustainable development goals, and in particular, sustainable development goal two, to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Many now fear that the recent challenges due to COVID-19 have set back our progress in implementing the 2030 agenda. There is, broad agreement, there is broad agreement that we need to transform our food systems due to the inability to provide a healthy diet for all, pressures on our natural resources base, imbalances and inequalities socially and economically. How to do it and the challenges that come with it have to be understood and tackled at the country level. The food systems in our region are diverse. At different stages of development, with different challenges and different external pressures, limited public spending, natural resources constraint, socio-political considerations. To transform and improve food systems require multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary action, engaging policymakers, the private sector, civil society, and academia. Coming together to listen to each other's viewpoints and engage in decision-making at national and local levels. Discussions and actions are ongoing. What is being done and what more should be done to build more sustainable food system and assure healthy diets in our region. Subsequently, FAO looks forward 
to the inputs from the members and the observers at the roundtable discussion at the upcoming regional conference. We believe, and I believe, it is very important opportunity for information exchange and sharing of best practices and experiences on sustainable food systems and healthy diets. Let us learn from each other and determine what further actions are needed in our region. The outcome of discussions at the regional conference should inform the work of the recently established UN Regional Issue-Based Coalition on Sustainable Food System. And I'm very happy to see with us the representative of WHO, who we organization which is actively cooperating with us in this regard. And should also feed into the UN Food System Summit to be held in 2021. Let us join our efforts to ensure that our food supply chains remain resilient to ensure food and nutrition security and to build back better and stronger and address the fragilities and weaknesses in our food systems. Where the opportunities have arisen, let's harness them. And where challenges remain, together we can find solution. Wish you a very productive discussion and thank you very much for the opportunity. All the best to all of you. Thank you, uh, Vladimir. Um, as, as you said, um, the food systems are um, need to be sustainable. The outbreak of the COVID showed the vulnerability of the food systems uh, around the world. So we need to give uh, further attention to the entire system, including agricultural production, food chain operators, trade and distribution patterns, management of the food safety, animal health, as well as also plant uh, risks. So short-term challenges uh, came out of COVID, but long-term uh, implications are also expected. So we have lots to discuss for the regional conference. Uh, and to do this, I'm glad um, to have such an excellent uh, panel supporting the introduction of this item um, of this topic to the regional conference. So let me welcome you all and uh, to introduce you here also uh, to the audience. And uh, thanks again also Vladimir Molegovic for uh, this introduction. Rint Akius, the vice president of the Turkish Federation of Food and Drink Industry Association. Um, it has uh, 27 sexual member association and is covering more than 2000 uh, companies in the country. Um, he says, educate the public integrate agriculture into industry to achieve sustainability and balanced and adequate uh, nutrition. I'm also welcoming Zhao Breda, the head of the FAO European Office for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases in Moscow. And Zhao says the food system revolution is at the crossroads between sustainability and health. Let me, uh, in addition, welcome Isabel Alvarez, Vice President and Advocacy Offer of Urgency. And Urgency is part of the Nienelani Europe and Central Asia Food Sovereignty Network. Facing the challenge of malnutrition requires a holistic analysis because healthy diets require sustainable food systems. And these require a healthy planet and social justice is being set by Isabel. I think this is uh, quite important. In addition, let me welcome Rada Kelarova, Policy Officer of the European Commission DG Health and Food Safety, known also as DG Santé, who says Europe's goal to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050 can only be achieved by making our food systems sustainable. I'm very happy to also welcome Eva uh, Halichka, senior researcher at the Department of Food uh, Market and Consumer Research at Warsaw University of Life Science in Poland, who says all actors have a vital part to play in the pivoting of the food systems to for, uh, award sustainable uh, nutrition. In addition, I would also like to um, mention that we have Gulnas Kaseyeva, who is the chairperson of AgroLead. AgroLead is a holding um, company um, in Kyrgyzstan with uh, also having consultancies as well as also an agri-cooperatives. We will have a video statement of um, Gulnas 
uh, later on. So a warm welcome to all of you on this virtual round table. And before we are going to uh, start our discussion on the various aspects, which is already coming out from um, the statements you have made, let's look a bit closer on the issues regarding the situation in the, the region. And let's uh, look at the video um, from Mary introducing us uh, to the topic. Hello, thanks for watching this talk on sustainable food systems and healthy diets. If you are a consumer who wants safe, nutritious food for yourself and your family, or a farmer or food business who depends on food and agriculture for your livelihood, or indeed if you're a policymaker engaged in improving the agri-food sector in your country, food systems and how food is produced, used and consumed concerns you. I am Mary Kenny and I work at FAO's regional office for Europe and Central Asia. In this talk, I will address a few different key questions, including why the focus now on food systems and urgent call for transformation? What do we mean by sustainability? And what are actions and possible entry points to shape and transform our food systems? These issues are all very relevant to the roundtable discussion, which will take place at the 32nd session of the FAO Conference for Europe. Firstly, why the focus on food systems? Let us take a closer look at the food and nutrition situation in our region. While the food and agriculture sector has performed impressively and there is a very low prevalence of hunger, we do have challenges with undernutrition, access to the required quality and range of nutritious foods, and micronutrient deficiencies also persist in certain countries. Alarmingly, overweight and obesity is now a major issue in the region. In addition, other pressures show the inadequacy of our systems. There's concern about the toll on the environment and natural resource base as a result of how food is produced and consumed. Concerns with land degradation, over-exploitation of fish stocks, pressure on our water sources, loss of biodiversity, increase in greenhouse gas emissions, and the stark statistic that one third of all food is being lost or wasted. We have inequalities and imbalances throughout our food system. We also have many urban and rural poor who cannot access nutritious diverse diets. And more recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed a number of fragilities in our food systems, reconfirming the need to ensure our systems are resilient to shocks. So what do we understand by food systems? FAO defines them as the entire range of activities, goods and services involved in the production, trading, processing, marketing, consumption and disposal of goods that originate from agriculture, forestry or fisheries. It covers everything from land reform to natural resource management to food production and value chains, to managing food chain risks. Food systems also include people and institutions, as well as the socio-political, economic and technological environment surrounding these activities. Although COVID-19 has put a spotlight on food systems, the discussions on sustainable food systems has been ongoing for some time. Transforming food systems is at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and specifically SDG2, Ending Hunger. This focus builds on many global commitments already made and ongoing initiatives. As we look forward, the UN Food Systems Summit to be held in 2021 will be an important milestone, recognizing that many countries are facing challenges in building their food systems. At a regional level, the issue-based coalition on sustainable food systems established in April 2020 provides a mechanism for increased cooperation and fosters close partnership. So why is a holistic systems approach being promoted? Clearly food systems are not new, but what is gaining momentum is the call to adopt a more holistic approach and to address the three dimensions of sustainability across economic, social 
environmental issues. Adopting a systemic approach should redress the current reality where complex challenges in the food and agriculture, trade and health portfolios are often dealt with through isolated, fragmented policies with due regard for the interconnections and even trade-offs that may need to be made. And as we seek to ensure the sustainability of our food systems, we are aware that we want many things from our food systems. We want them to be environmentally sound, to support livelihoods and inclusive economic growth, and ultimately to deliver healthy diets for all. It is only natural that there are competing priorities and trade-offs will have to be made. Some examples of trade-offs may include balancing decisions between agricultural production and the use of natural resources, or trade policy decisions and how they may affect on livelihoods and nutritional status. It is clear that we need a political process to understand trade-offs and to strike a balance between these competing priorities. There is growing evidence that a business as usual model is not acceptable and some examples of transformation which may take place in the agri-food system are transforming food production for more diversified foods and sustainable systems, including the uptake of agroecological approaches, improving food supply chains and markets at home and abroad, and finally improving food environments through consumer behaviour. Understanding the local context is just so key. What is challenging, however, is to identify the right set of reforms needed and to generate the evidence so that stakeholders can understand how these reforms will improve food systems and healthy diets. So what approaches are available to transform food systems at country level? Members are encouraged, are called to provide an, envir an enabling environment and governance mechanism to support the food systems transformation agenda to promote dialogue among multiple stakeholders, which will foster policy coherence. This recognizes the important role non-state actors play, including the private sector, to drive responsible investments that consider sustainability and to support scaling up of innovative practices. Social movements and consumers can also drive the sustainability agenda. Furthermore, there is a need to invest in data and evidence collection to enhance our understanding of synergies and trade-offs. And we need to address the power inequalities in our food systems to foster a more people-centred approach. People working together will help identify solutions that are win-wins for both human and planetary health. I would like to conclude by wishing you good discussions at the upcoming FAO Regional Conference for Europe. It's an opportunity to share experiences on transforming food systems and to engage with FAO. The fragilities of our food systems have been exposed by COVID-19, but it has only served to reconfirm the importance of supporting smallholders and rural development, agri-food trade and market integration and natural resource management and climate change mitigation actions. And while there are challenges, many, Opportunities to drive long-term transformation also have arisen and need to be harnessed. We should not focus on short-term solutions only. Let's take this opportunity to build back better, stronger food and agriculture systems, ensuring no one is left behind, and to provide healthy diets for all, protecting our planet today and for future generations. Thank you for listening. And until we meet again, here in Budapest, in your country, or at the UN Food Systems Summit, take very good care. Mary indicated that we should build back better and stronger food and agriculture systems. So we need to transform our production structures and we need to move to more diversified structures. In the past, agricultural policies focused very much 
on uh, production incentives. So we, some of us probably know the common agriculture policy of the European Union uh, was focusing on this up to the 1980s. But how are we able to move here in the right direction, achieving also the universality of the SDGs, which means on one hand production efficiency, uh, but on the other hand, of course, environmental and also uh, social goals uh, to be achieved. So let me, in this case, turn maybe to you, Rada. Um, how do you see um, really uh, transforming the production structure uh, from the EU perspective? As we focusing on transforming the food production, how can we balance the need to produce more food of increased diversity, manage the global food market, uh, with also stressing on the environment and the natural resources. So what do, what do you see from the European Union perspective? Well, first of all, we, we don't believe that we need to choose between producing enough nutritious, affordable and safe food for everyone and protecting our planet. With the farm to fork strategy that we adopted uh, last May, we believe we can do both whilst also ensuring the livelihood of all actors in the food supply chain. Next to addressing uh, food production by aiming at making it sustainable, the strategy also addresses food demand and food consumption. It has the ambition to halve food waste by 2030 and reduce food losses. And in this respect, uh, by 2023, we will propose legally binding targets to reduce food waste across the EU. But the strategy also recognizes that the transition to a sustainable food system will not happen without a shift in people's diets towards healthier and sustainable diets. Moving to a more plant-based diet with less red meat and processed meat and with more fruits and vegetables will not only have a positive impact on people's health, but will also lower the environmental impact of the food system. This will also mean uh, may, I, may I interrupt you at this way? Let's let's stick on the let's say on the consumer maybe a bit later. I would like us still to stay maybe under the production uh, side uh, because um, I, I think uh, the production system is something which uh, I would say is is definitely uh, quite important. And maybe Isabel, um, urgency always emphasized that there is a need that uh, the food system needs to be changed. I know. You are also, um, I, I, I looked a bit also on some of the videos, you're a strong supporter also of agroecology. So where would you, from uh, the point of view of urgency, like to see the change in our current food systems? And what, where do you think they are the threats or the opportunities, um, particularly for the urban and the rural community? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, because, uh, sorry, I lost the connection. Uh, can you repeat the, 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 the question, please? Because I lost the connection for a moment. Yeah, uh, so uh, Isabel, Urgency always emphasized that there is a need to change the food systems. And uh, we know uh, there is also a very strong interest um, to use agroecology as, as, as part of it. So where do you uh, think um, there is the change needed in the food systems and what do you think are the threats or opportunities for the urban, uh, urban and the rural communities? Okay, okay. of course the, the first change that we will uh, like to, to see is to, to see all people fed and, and food systems that uh, guarantee access to healthy food for, for all people. No? Um, this uh, change, as you said, uh, requires a multidimensional perspective. And uh, we uh, highlight that the, it's really, really important to have the, the resources to feed people and also to be fed. You know? uh, if we need to feed people, we need the access to land, we need to preserve our biodiversity. Uh, we need uh, uh, markets at, at local uh, level. Um, and uh, yeah, and we also uh, need res uh, resources to, to be uh, fed no? with, with real food. Um, sometimes we, we hear uh, about the, um, 
the decision making power of uh, consumers and we know that uh, many of our uh, decisions are not based on our preferences or our um, health <clears throat> sorry uh, our uh, many decisions are based on the resources that we have and we know that today uh, the unhealthy food is more accessible uh, that healthy food in in in, in some uh, regions no so and also if we look at public procurement sometimes the the main criteria for for that uh, are not uh, healthy criteria are our prices or our other uh, issues, no? Uh, and uh, talking about the the opportunities and challenges that we we were asking, uh, I think um, now with COVID nineteen, uh, we are uh, seeing how the um, we need resilient uh, uh, models, and we are I think we are demonstrating our, in our experience. Uh, from civil society and also, of course, uh, from urgency, we are uh, seeing how the local uh, models, the local networks are being really, really resilient in, in this situation. And I think this has to be, uh, they preserve these models and preserve these uh, networks has to be a priority on public policies. And of course, the, the challenge is that is let's, is let's also, Isabel, when we talk about the policies, come later later on uh, down the discussion. Actually, a quick question back to to Rada, um, when because you mentioned the farm to fork um, strategy, would you say um, there is a definite, a clear answer in that one? Also, based on the COVID experience for the uh, let's say for the production part. Would you see there is something in, uh, on this which we can clearly identify? Well, yes, obviously, as was also indicated in the introduction, the COVID-19 pandemic showed the need for a robust and resilient food system that is capable of ensuring access to food to everyone and not least in times of crisis. And also we have um, drawn the lessons from the COVID-19 in the farm to fork strategy because we are also foreseeing as an action um, to, to develop a contingency plan that will uh, ensure food security in times of crisis. So um, this is uh, perfectly um, encompassed in the, in the strategy. Let's, let's maybe move uh, in that sense then a bit uh, further up um, in the supply chain. If we go uh, away from the structure, uh, from the production, um, then um, how is this, for particularly also at the processes or the traders level? Maybe, uh, Joa, I want to ask you um, from the point of view of WHO, in particular also related to the objective of the sustainable and healthy diet. What actions can be taken in our food supply chains to provide such diets? And, and how can we balance um, the different stakeholders' interest in, in this here? Thank you very much for the, the opportunity. Clearly, uh, this is a complex system, but at the end of the day, we believe that there are um, actions that need to be taken if we want to have healthier and more sustainable diets. They require that we really reduce animal foods very significantly. We increase the share of vegetable origin foods. This is a must, particularly for the European region countries. And we also need to make sure that we reduce the presence of harmful and uh, nutrients that are related or elements that are related in non-communicable diseases. Because we have to remember that in the European region, we have either one out of three or one out of four kids that are already overweight and obese. So we can talk about this forever, but if we don't take action, and this action is very straightforward, there's too much sugar in Europe uh, from everywhere. You look at baby foods, you look at the, the unacceptable levels of marketing of foods to children. I mean, the digital marketing, which is so challenging at the moment, all of this has a huge influence. So we need to reduce sugar, fat. We need to eliminate trans fats. We have now 37 countries out of 53 countries, members of WHO Europe with a ban on trans fat. But we want to be 
we would like to be the first region completely green in terms of trans fats. And we are moving fast in that direction, but we have to be very clear that diet, health, and sustainability need to come together. But we need to support countries in the way they do it. The sustainable, healthy diets in one country may not have exactly the same recipe in another country. Countries need support. There are tools, for example, the food procurement, public procurement is a great tool to move on with diets. And your national interpretation of what is a healthy and sustainable diet is important. Okay, we need a planetary diet, that's fine. We need less vegetable, uh, more vegetables, less meat, less sugar, all of those things, eliminating salt as much as we can because it's related with so many non-communicable diseases as well. But at the end of the day, this needs to be translated at the national level. It's not the same when we refer to, uh, you know, certain types of foods in one country and another. The Mediterranean area is very different from the Eastern part of Europe. And therefore, using inspiration from traditional diets, we believe that we can build for Europe leadership. Europe can lead and maybe it's the best region position to lead on healthy and sustainable diets. It's based on complex systems, but at the end of the day, solutions are not that complicated. Yeah, Jean, what, what would you say in this case? Um, because we are, of course, from an international organization point of view, um, we're talking uh, a lot about governments, but what would we say um, WHO is giving as a recommendation um, maybe also to the private sector, because when we are talking about uh, sugar-free, um, what, what you also mentioned, uh, the, the private sector has here also its role to play. So what would you uh, say we would need to recommend here? And then I, I will ask Rind afterwards if he agrees. So... Um, yeah, of course, the private sector is extremely important. We need to work with all stakeholders and private sector needs to be part of the solution here. Obviously, Sometimes there are situations where the role of uh, governments through legislation or regulation could be more significant. There are areas where the private sector can contribute to, with their own initiatives. And sometimes it's a combination of both. Areas like salt, for example, there is a good history of private sector really contributing significantly. In other areas, it, sometimes it's the private sector that says, no, we prefer the government to take the lead on monitoring and, and regulating digital marketing or on sugar because they can create better a level playing field. So it's about dialogue, it's about collaboration, it's about taking action, not, we don't need to discuss so much anymore because we need what, we know what needs to be done, is about really taking action in promoting better quality foods. You look at baby, commercial baby foods in Europe, they are full of sugar, huge amounts. Is that acceptable? Of course not. The industry needs to understand that they need to also transform themselves and providing better diets. It's consumer demand, but also the offer has to be there. So I think uh, working with all stakeholders, NGOs of course are also extremely important, not just the private sector. And we believe that it's based on dialogue and the mix of policies where of course, Governments need to take the lead and need to inspire the action that is needed. Rint, would you would you agree to that? What uh, Zhao in that sense says? What is the responsibility of the uh, private sector in, in this case? Or would you say, okay, we have to leave it more to the government? Uh, we can only produce what uh, what the consumer is is demanding. So how how do the food businesses really? balance here um, on one hand improving sustainability but on the other hand of course business oriented um, and, and, and the demands so what kind of efforts are being done uh, from the food industry in this context? Well let me put it this way I uh, agree on one thing with Joao is that we have to communicate we have to establish a common denominator on understanding what the food and nutrition is we are totally against, as the industry, to demonizing certain articles like salt, sugar, fats, flour, etc. Anything which appears on the list of Codex Alimentarius 
is not harmful to human health. The thing which makes it harmful is the amount or the dosage you take. Therefore, instead of saying that uh, sugar is harmful, I think World Health Organization should take the lead in educating the public on a balanced and adequate nutrition or a diet. Because everything which is on the list of codex is something that we can eat. If we want to warn the consumers that eating something in excess is harmful, then we should put warnings on everything, including the basic thing, which is water. If we drink more than six liters of water, we die. We know that. Therefore, we should educate the consumer on how to have a balance and how to eat adequately. Because I fully agree with you on the obesity, obesity issue. I fully agree on, uh, with you on the uh, non-communicable diseases. However, the issue is to have the same common denominator on every problems we have. Our approaches is, is different. We don't believe uh, too much regulation or forced uh, regulation by the government helps us. We think we should understand the problems jointly and in a joint manner. I don't think we've been able to uh, achieve that with the WHO so far. WHO, I understand that so far has seen the industry as, well, uh, I shouldn't say enemy, but it's something that to be fought with. WHO always approached the industry with restrictions on the governmental level. Industry A has to deliver what the consumer wants, that's for sure. What the consumer wants could be leaded by WHO on educating them. Re so let, 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 uh, you have mentioned two, two points which I think we should uh, also take up uh, uh, further down. First, I mean, again, the role of the consumer, I said it also at the beginning already, uh, when also Rada and uh, Isabel started, let's uh, bring that as well as, of course, also the policy recommendations. I mean, the policy recommendations um, of governments and international organizations are probably very closely also related. But I want to take up one point more, uh, and that is, when you look at it from the industry point of view, would you say the, the COVID implications are uh, an opportunity or giving us an opportunity to change some of the of the food systems um, and do you see there are real opportunities raymond we published a book in june this is about 100 pages it reflects the aftermath of the COVID 19 issue the three major findings we have is that we have lack of communication between agriculture and industry, which led to a chaos. We have lack of coordination between major players, which led to inefficiency. And collaboration has become more important than ever, which we have to reestablish and restructure. Today, the government was not uh, quick enough to intervene with the COVID-19 issue as far as the food security side is concerned. It was the private sector, especially the uh, food chain, the couriers, the people on the motorcycles who delivered the food to homes where we had lockdowns. Therefore, we have to learn from this. Of course, there are certain issues that we can uh, do, which we have already started. Uh, we are uh, trying to use the large purchasing power of the uh, multinational companies to educate the farmers as far as, for instance, while well, we are trying to uh, buy food items or raw material, which uses less water, which uses, uh, I mean, in sustainable matter, but this is not the issue right now. The major problem we are going to face in our part of the world, which is Southeast Europe, 
Um, as the Federation, we had ordered a uh, research to Istanbul uh, Technical University, which we published as a book in 2018. It says that by 2032, climate change will affect the region. And its effects is going to reach its peak uh, by 2050, which means that the climate, the warming will reach up and as of today, it's going to drive the areas where we grow food right now. So that's the major threat. We have to be ready for it. This, this is this is very much uh, this is very much in line also what um, Rada said as one of her uh, clear statements. The European Union wants to be amongst the first, um, let's say, continent to have a climate. A neutral uh, approach, but but uh, of course, uh, like like several of you also mentioned, uh, the consumer uh, plays uh, plays an Im important role in in in, yeah. in that uh, context. Now, the the question the question uh, is here: Are is it made easy if we are putting all the blame on the consumer and saying, okay, uh, the, the 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 problem is the consumer? If the consumer is going to get it right, everything else. Is, um, is also going uh, to change. So when we talk about the responsibilities of the, uh, of the consumer, um, what, so what kind of emphasis do we need to give? Or maybe I'm asking Eva in, in that sense, um, of course she looks at it not from the consumer perspective, but more uh, also from the research and, and having done a lot of uh, research in that context. Um, if the, the what, what do we need to do in order to have a demand for a healthier diet? Um, do we need to have strong relations uh, regulations? Sorry, um, in reducing some of these food items. I mean, Zhao was saying, okay, less sugar, less salt. Um, is or what? What? What is needed in order to move the consumer in the right direction? Or education is that sufficient? I think this is such a, a fascinating um, topic from the point of view of the consumer. Uh, yes, I have been doing research for at least uh, 20 years here in Poland and in Europe. And I have seen and I'm observing how consumers change. They, are, they get a lot of information. Uh, we have seen a lot of educational also initiatives in the region. And the, the change has been slow. I think there was also a lot of, uh, um, well, too much information. I, sometimes it is misinformation. Uh, the health messages have uh, for sure come through. Uh, people know that they should um, have a healthier diet. Now the challenge is, is to add the uh, sustainable, or the the recommendations linked to sustainability and not make the message uh, more complex. People often don't understand or, or if, if they think something is too complex, they just switch off. Uh, the sustainability uh, linked recommendations that should be added also in um, different uh, food-based dietary guidelines that already exist or are being developed in some parts of the region are quite simple. I'll give just an example. Eat or choose food locally, eat seasonally. And um, I think also for policymakers, it is uh, an opportunity to engage with um, consumer groups which are also becoming stronger. For many um, years or even decades, uh, consumer organizations um, were not heard or their voice was quite dispersed and um, quiet, I may say. They're always at the end of, um, of the discussion, very often at, at the table. So, um, but, but I have seen a big change. I think the shift in awareness of consumers is very, very near. We have, 920 million consumers in the uh, region, in the ECA region, Europe and uh, Central Asia region, which we're talking about. 920 million consumers, okay. Some of them 
don't buy food, but they're still linked to the market, even if they uh, are supported by um, food banks, for example, or um, they eat only the food that they produce. We're all, we are all linked to the food market. And there's a big uh, shift in the awareness that I have seen coming. And it, I think even COVID in a way, it's a paradox, but COVID uh, will accelerate the shift. And just clear messages. I think uh, these uh, food-based dietary guidelines that incorporate sustainable uh, diet, diet uh, sustainable diet messages uh, will, uh, will have a huge impact on the consumers, strengthening their uh, ability to choose on the market. And that will shift and that will help uh, improve the food system in a very, hopefully, uh, near future. So if I hear you in, in that sense, you would say it needs to be simple. Uh, the messages need to be simple and we need to uh, increase um, so or we need to empower the consumer further. Um, in this case, Rada, uh, let me turn uh, here again also to the commission. The, the commission is not always considered, uh, forgive me if I'm making this statement, to make things simple. So um, would you say uh, farm to fork uh, strategies and wh what do you see from the commission's point of view needs to happen to maybe make it simpler, to make it better understandable to the consumer and um, in that sense to change the consumer behavior? Well, I, I, I think that what we have proposed uh, and that we have put forward in the strategy when it comes to um, uh, ensuring a, a sustainable consumption is actually trying to make things simpler for the consumer because we believe that uh, an informed consumer can therefore be able to be to will be empowered to choose the healthy and sustainable diets and we have basically put forward a number of initiatives that uh, we will come up with by 2022 and uh, these are in the area of food labeling and we will propose, for instance, a harmonized uh, mandatory front of pack nutrition labeling. We will also consider the possibility to uh, extend the mandatory origin or provenance indication for certain products. And uh, finally, in the longer term, we will also consider the possibility to develop a sustainability labeling framework, which will encompass all three dimensions of sustainability in order to give a simpler information, as you said, uh, because this is indeed the key uh, to consumers about this um, about these elements. So we do believe that uh, with our actions, we will make it possible for consumers to choose healthy and sustainable diets in the future. I think um, one of the, of the key points certainly is that when we're talking about uh, consumer choice, um, consumer empowerment, um, information, uh, again, uh, the, the right depends also on the costs um, because the FAO, for example, has for the 2020 um, state of food insecurity, we have looked into affordable diets also. Um, so as a consumer, you don't have a, a right to choose um, if uh, it's not uh, affordable. So I, I think this is definitely also an issue um, which needs to come into the equation. A um, lot to discuss more under this one on the, on the consumer. Um, what I would like uh, to take a moment um, and, and in this case, uh, shift here the discussion uh, before we come into the policy recommendation to the case of Kyrgyzstan. And um, I would like to hear from uh, Gulnat, um, from the agro-lead in Kyrgyzstan, um, to see what are the efforts made there to move to a more uh, sustainable food systems. And she has uh, given us a, a video where she summarizes this. Gulnat. Good morning to everyone. My name is Gulnaz Kaseva. I am a chairperson of the board of Public Association Agrolit from Kyrgyzstan. And uh, today uh, I would like to share with you with one idea um, to solve the problems of food security in Kyrgyzstan. 
Kyrgyzstan is an agrarian country where more than 70% of the population live in rural areas, of which 65% are employed in the agriculture sector. So in Kyrgyzstan, uh, we have a lot of small-scale farmers. The, uh, the reason was the land reform after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, uh, there were period a lot of new farmers. So since the new farmers didn't have uh, needed uh, knowledge and experience on the agriculture sector, uh, there was needed an extension services. So public association agrolyte is one of the extension services in Kyrgyzstan. It was established in 2009, and uh, during the 11 years of our activities, we implemented about 100 projects in the agriculture sector. Currently, uh, the uh, extension services in Kyrgyzstan come from different sectors. It's from state, public, and non-governmental organization, and private. But all these types of consulting services work on their own way and each pursuing its um, own goals. There is no general coordination of work in the agriculture sector among NGOs, business sector, and government bodies. Uh, thus, there is a duplication of work. Each organization works in fragments, pursuing its own goals. And it affects, affects in general to the efficiency of agriculture development in Kyrgyzstan. For example, the situation with COVID-19 showed that there are big problems with the food security in Kyrgyzstan. Meanwhile, developed small-scale commodities and competitive volumes and prices require coordinated actions of, from the all the stakeholders. So one of the in initiatives of public association Akralit was the creation, the association of extension services. And in 2019, we established Kyrgyzstan Forum of Rural Advisory Services. The main idea was to create a common platform for all the stakeholders to discuss and uh, try to solve jointly the main topics in the agriculture sector, including the food security issues. And as a result, uh, on September 2020, there was signed a memorandum of understanding between Ministry of Agriculture and KG Fras. And the purpose of this agreement was to bring together all sectors involved in agriculture sectors to, to coordinate actions in agriculture for the agriculture development. Thank you very much for the, your attention and uh, uh, I wish you a good discussion. And if you have a question, I will be uh, ha happy to answer it. So uh, Guna says there's little coordination at the level of the food chain actors and they are trying to improve it. Um, I, I think this confirms that there is a need to improve uh, the governance uh, mechanisms. Now, uh, I think efforts are uh, being be made. Uh, in this case, uh, Isabel, I, and as we are talking now also about policy recommendations, um, how, how do you see that from your perspective from World Jensen's? Are we moving in the right direction? Are we adjusting? decision-making processes? Are we empowering also the civil society more? Uh, I mean, the civil society, actually, we are all part of the consumer. Uh, everybody uh, around the table is certainly a consumer, but is the civil society in a better position to participate? And what do you think uh, can the civil society do um, in, in this context that we are moving to a, a different governance mechanism? Yes. Yes. Um... Yeah, I, I know we are moving. That is, is good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, and, and uh, from our perspective, uh, we think that we need um, inclusive and participatory processes for, uh, yeah, to build together uh, public policies. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, in this sense, I think it's important you were talking about the consumers, the decision, and how um, I I won't uh, talk about it again. But I think it's important to to say that we are when we are talking about food, we are talking about a human right, and uh, when we are talking about this um, multi multi stakeholders, <clears throat> sorry platforms, uh, we need to make visible that. Um, uh, of course, uh, I, we agree that everybody has to be around the table. Uh, all of us are part of the food systems, but we need to make clear that uh, there are multi stakeholders and right holders. And we think that this is really, really important when we sit all uh, around the table. And it's not only 
uh, to see who uh, is or not uh, there is also from where is uh, each um, each part, you know. And for us, this uh, difference between uh, multi-stakeholder and right holder is really really important when we are talking about food, because we, for us the the human right approach is a key point uh, when we are building these sustainable food systems. And about the role of civil society, of course, we are involved in different uh, spaces. Uh, you know it. <laughs> and uh, I think sometimes the, the question maybe uh, could be if uh, it's possible to build a sustainable food system without civil society uh, involvement, no? uh, without farmers, without fisheries, uh, without indigenous people, without young people, without women. Um, we think that the centrality of people is the is the key, no, uh, to to this uh, construction that we that we need, no, and yeah, this is our point. And uh, you would, in principle, say that um, the policies need to be more people centric, because you just mentioned uh, that uh, we are probably uh, make sure that they are all involved, and therefore the policy need to be more uh, people centric. Let me, in this case, um, Zhao asking uh, this from the perspective of um, an international organization, WHO. Do, do, you, do you think we have to do more uh, in terms of uh, making our policies more people-centric or what, what, what do you think we need to do in that sense? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We fully agree with that. From the health perspective, we talk about people-centered health systems and here is, people-centered food systems. And I think there might be a lot to learn there uh, as well in terms of process and how you devise and then implement your, your strategies. It's a bit to, um, to understand the, the need to do it in a comprehensive way. It's not, again, just about education and people making the right choices in terms of if I am a consumer or about devising the right regulations that then will promote healthier and more sustainable diets. It's, it's how you can understand this complexity and then put forward a system where individuals and human beings are, are human beings are actually at the center. And that's a that's a tremendous shift. And I'd like to say that that's as very much in line with what it is the new very challenging and very interesting EU policy is really about leadership. And this uh, Europe and Central Asia region to a large extent, I believe it can, it can be on the driving seat. It can really take the lead in terms of the, the changes that are necessary because you have the most vibrant industry, the most vibrant research. And, and really it's also give, going to give you a competitive advantage. You not only have the amazing Nordic Mediterranean diets, the fantastic mix of foods in Central Asia, but you also have the knowledge and the brain and the technology. It's not about everybody has a role to play. And here is really placing the individuals, you could say the consumer, but it's more than that. And then the link with health, look what COVID did to our lives. Without health, really, there's nothing else. And what we see sometimes is that by producing the foods we are producing, by incorporating ingredients that we incorporate in foods, we are not protecting health. I'm sorry to say, but a soft drink with 40 grams of sugar, this is not a healthy product. And I could give you hundreds of examples. So really there needs to be you know, a transition into, of course, the consumer has to want it, but consumers, you have more and more vegans. I'm not saying becoming vegan is the right solution, probably not, because you can also have, you know, uh, vegan processed foods, which at the end of the day, will, they will not be very healthy as well. So it's more complex than that. So it's really acting all together. And we ourselves, international organizations, we have responsibilities in terms of coming up with, you know, with, with guidance to member states and supporting member states at, at the national level. And I think that we all have to work more, more together. So I really support 
our organizations working together and we welcome very nicely and very happy with the EU initiative, which, which I think it's, I'm convinced is going to make a big difference and uh, it can really make, make a challenge and impact the overall region, which for WHO has 53 countries. When we, when, we, when we want to make, uh, and we want to give this good example for the region, and as you, as you said, we need to uh, bring the people in. And, and I, I think actually the, 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 the COVID crisis in these days shows again with the, the, the figures are going up that if we are not getting the people into the boat, it's very difficult to get the measures through. So here, Radha, do you think the farm to fork strategy um, has the adequate policy coherence um, in place so that uh, we are really able to reach uh, the people? Or is it in the end uh, a document or an approach where people say, oh, okay, yeah, it sounds good for us as experts, it's great, but um, it's not uh, simple enough. Like uh, Eva was also saying to uh, the, the, the consumer uh, to understand this. How would you see that? Well, we see the farm to fork strategy as a strategy that has this holistic approach that we were just talking about. And indeed, we have put forward actions for every single actor in the food supply chain, but also beyond. It's not just farmers, as we can often hear, that need to make uh, efforts in order to transition to sustainable food systems. It's all primary producers, but it's also food manufacturers, processors, distributors, consumers, but even beyond that, as was uh, rightly pointed out, I mean, we need people from the financial, from the research and innovation sector, because indeed you, you need new solutions to, to face some of the, to overcome some of the challenges that we are facing today. And uh, this solution needs to be financed. And uh, also, you need the intervention of actors from the advisory services sectors because they need to transmit these new solutions to the actors on the ground. So we think that really this um, food systems approach that takes everybody on board and that will force us also to think uh, no longer in isolation. So just to give a concrete example, if we, if we say that uh, we want to reduce dependency on chemical pesticides, well, we also need to hear and uh, to understand that farmers need alternatives that are as efficient. And so what do we do? We need to invest in research and innovation. So to be able to find these alternatives. So these, all these sectors are very interlinked and this is what we are trying to bring uh, this coherence and this also consistency between all food related policies and there is also in the um, in the longer run and also it's one of the flagship initiatives of our strategy a legislative proposal on sustainable food systems that will bring this policy coherence and that will mainstream sustainability in all food related policies so we are believing that only together uh, we can we can achieve this transition successfully and uh, this is the reason why we we don't think that as you say it's just uh, maybe a paper but that we together make sure can make sure that this implementation and these transitions are successful rind, rind would you feel from the private sector point of view uh, there is already enough policy coherence and would, would you feel um, I mean, there is no transition to uh, a sustainable food system without the private sector. Would you feel you are supported in that sense uh, enough? I mean, the, the EU uh, farm to fork strategy, of course, um, is probably also spilling over to an, associ an association country like Turkey. Uh, but uh, of course, there are probably also other issues from, from your point of view. Well, basically, I fully agree uh, with brother. I mean, uh... COVID-19 has taught us a lot. Today we've realized that uh, we have discrepancies in major parts of the farm to fork strategy. Therefore, this has to be uh, fixed and we have to adapt new strategies. Today, probably it's not true for our region, but we have to talk about the basic right of human beings to reach food. Our area is not a famine area but in general we have this problem as well we have to address that as well uh, it's quite complex we as the private sector has a great role in this and we are ready to, to play our role 
as it is described by the policies, but mainly with dialogue with all major agencies. This is very important. Dialogue is essential. Uh, today we see the carbon footprint as a major issue. And if we don't reverse the uh, climate change, we will pay a very, very dear price for that one. And we need cooperation of everyone in this issue. That's the first one. Then the uh, resources will not be sufficient when we come to 2050. We have to look into it. We have to pay more attention to innovation. We have to pay more attention to biotechnology, which is going to be the key in uh, 20 or 30 years to come. These are the issues that the policymakers will have to address. We're ready, as far as we are concerned, as producers, but still I'd like to emphasize the fact that dialogue is the most essential thing. I think I, I take this issue uh, from the dialogue very much in, uh, let's say, further on. And uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I see also that we are uh, coming a bit an end in terms of, of the time. Um, I, I have one actually point which I wanted to raise again also with Zhao, but maybe others of you may also want to come in. Um, is because we, we, we need policy coherence, we need to invest more, we need to do the education um, uh, for the consumer, uh, we, we need to put more investment into uh, the three dimensions of uh, sustainable food systems, healthy diet. Um, are we in danger with the COVID that there are not enough public resources available in order to put an emphasis on that because we need to put much more on health? Uh, Zhao, any, any views on this from your side? No, I mean, the uh, health sector in many countries has been tremendously underfunded. So it, it's important and countries are now stepping up their, their investments and so on. So I really don't see that there is a competition here by investing in NCD prevention, non-communicable diabetes, obesity, cancer, cardiovascular disease. If you prevent today, you're saving a lot of money and you're also you're creating healthier consumers that will live more time and they will still be even more informed and better consumers. They will spend more money because they will have more capacity to have you know, more, more funds available and so on and so forth. So I don't think that either or, I think that we really need to have a comprehensive approach. And this is why it is very important that international organizations and the different stakeholders really work together on this one to look for the commonality where what can bring us all together. I really think that the future is, is in the interconnection between health and sustainability, clearly using food-based dietary guidelines, but like Eva very well was saying, put on the top the sustainability and then you will have a perfect recipe, I would say, and where the European farmers will be uh, very well off. I'm very convinced of that because that will be about being more competitive as well. So it's about working together and uh, uh, really fine tuning uh, how we can do that in, in a better way. Eva, Eva, would you would you say um, if you look at it from a research point of view, are you confident that there is also enough money still put inside in order to make this transformation, um, and and that you're not in danger that with the COVID um, research here is not going to be given the same emphasis as now? Oh, I, I'm I'm unfortunately not uh, confident about that. Um... We will see. Uh, I have we made a little research in the past, and we also know this was what I would like to emphasize that the consumers differ. Uh, rural uh, people living in rural areas and urban areas um, have a different approach to sustainability. Research here in Poland showed that uh, people living in uh, rural areas know more about sustainability. Uh, respect food more so people can also we can we can we can see the differences so I would just uh, hope there will be enough uh, resources to not only educate but also see the the changes but in different uh, consumer groups uh, as you know 
consumers, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural differences, geographical, demographical, we have many groups. Of course, the message can be one and simple and clear, but then when we go deeper, uh, the message will be more effective, the behavior change will be more effective if we really see the differences. We take into account. Unfortunately, we need to close. So um, we, we, I, I think we, we have many uh, interesting points. Uh, lots of points have been put on the table. Um, I think uh, lots of um, food for thought also for the member countries for the introduction of this um, agenda item um, at, at the regional conference, um, FAO, um, together, uh, and particularly the CFS, so the, the Committee for World Food Security is working on voluntary guidelines for um, sustainable uh, food systems, which are currently under negotiation. Um, so there are, of course, many efforts in the area of uh, production um, and uh, in the area of the food supply uh, chains, the, the, the food environment, we are coming a, a lot back also again to the consumer. Uh, we are putting a lot of, uh, in this case, on us uh, speaking as, as, as consumer. Um, so we, um, we definitely also need to see um, how uh, the different strategies are going to be uh, taken up. Uh, we have, of course, also um, the ICN2 uh, from FAO's uh, point of view, the framework for action, which is there. So there are many instruments, um, but I think we need uh, to do more on these three dimensions of sustainable food systems. So I would like to thank you for staying with us and for an interesting debate.